Quentin, ever since I've been a pre-teenager, the question of meaning, purpose, and life has, has frankly obsessed me, and as I've gotten older, the obsession hasn't diminished. I, I come to you as a philosopher to help me to understand this question from a philosophical way of thinking. I think your current attitude is the most mature and, in a sense, wise and the most rational attitude because no one has discovered the meaning of life. There is no consensus as to what it is. And so this questioning attitude you have is the attitude, I think, that is the best one. And then with what philosophers do is they distinguish different possibilities. And uh, one possibility is nihilism, that everything is meaningless, nothing is worth doing. And uh, you, this means in a real strict sense, so you can't commit suicide, because that's doing something. <laughs> This suicide is not worth doing. And uh, no, it's interesting, no philosopher throughout history has ever believed in nihilism. They've talked about it, no one's believed it. And I believed it once, but just for one second. It was at the end of a talk I was giving, and as I got to a certain line, it occurred to me that the conclusion was that life was meaningless. And as soon as I reached that conclusion, I stopped reading, and I stood still and didn't move, but because I couldn't, because uh, any, if I did, it would imply something was worth doing. <laughs> but that <laughs> the commentator came up and said, well, thank you, and, and people clapped, and so I went off the stage. So I, I believed it for one second. And uh, that's probably as long as you can believe it, because you really do believe it. You can't move, because any movement implies something. That movement activity is worth doing. What are other possibilities? Well, one possibility is that the meaning of life is not some grandiose, important thing, like people often think it is. It could be something uh, very trivial and irrelevant to human life. I mean, it could be that we can learn it right now. We can be passed the paper as the meaning of life, and that would not affect us, it would not change our lives at all. We'd continue to act tomorrow, the same we did today. And so the meaning of life uh, is not that important. And another attitude is that, well, it may be greatly important, as it usually is assumed to be, but that we cannot know it, even though how hard we struggle and how long we struggle, ever since philosophy began with Plato and earlier, and going back even to the early religions, uh, they've been struggling to try to answer it, but the consistency of failure suggests that maybe human beings are not intelligent enough to understand the meaning of life, but maybe some being, an uh, intelligent organism, who might be tel 10 times as intelligent as humans, might be able to be intelligent enough to understand it in the same way that we're more intelligent than squirrels. And so we're, we're intelligent enough to ask the question whether this hypothetical um, intelligent organism uh, who's more intelligent than us could know the answer. Now, many would say that there is a theist explanation that in some sense supernatural, cosmic consciousness, a personal God, you know the, the whole spectrum. And a field has emerged, philosophy of religion, in which philosophers seek to discern the deep structure of, of theology and, and, and religion. Now, how, how does this work? How, how, does, how can a philosopher look at religion and see if indeed that is an or the answer to the question of meaning and purpose? Oh, I think religion is like the science or philosophy of 2,000, 3,000 years ago. And the problem is that some people today, or many people today, still believe it, including some philosophers. So the value of that for philosophy is that philosophers cannot rest content and just dogmatically assume that God does not exist, but the theistic philosophers who believe that God exists, they require other philosophers to show why their arguments are wrong and why that science has, has long ago disproved God's existence. So you would see a very uh, limited philosophy of religion in the sense that, in your view, uh, philosophers need to show why God doesn't exist and to show those philosophers who do believe it that their arguments are wrong. I think so, right. So they, in the sense of philosophers who do believe it, they function 
as skeptics to the majority, to the scientists. Like there was a poll in Nature a while ago, 93% of the top scientists were atheists. And so the theists who believe in religion, they're like the skeptics of the scientific view and philosophers- Questioning the current order. Right, and then, then other philosophers would try and defend the current order by showing what was wrong with these other philosophers' ar arguments. So, in your view, what are some of the key arguments, philosophically, methodologically, to show that the philosophers who believe in theism, who are the skeptics of the current naturalistic order, that their arguments are not correct? Well, there are many arguments. I mean, there are the familiar ones, like the problem of evil, but the other ones are less familiar, but I think are more worthy of attention. Like, like psychology says that every instance of mind or consciousness we know of is involved with a body and brain. And then theism says there is this consciousness that has no body or brain or any sense of organs or anything, and that directly contradicts the human sciences, psychology. Well, the theists would turn it around, and they'd say, because you have that sense of consciousness, and that consciousness is real, therefore that infers that there is in, indeed a, a, a cosmic consciousness, some supernatural thing above that. Well, there's a long explanation in neurophysiology, the study of the brain, which they've done numerous tests on that show there is a part of the brain that starts working when you're awake and conscious, another part when you're asleep and unconscious, and they've traced this for lower mammals and back through evolution. So scientists have, have an enormous explanation, but theists don't have an explanation. They just assert, you know, God gave us a soul. You know, where's the argument? You know, well, the, the, the argument again says that consciousness is something that is is uh, 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 is, is something special, and therefore it it reflects a, a higher consciousness. Well, it depends what I mean by special. Okay, consciousness is special in the sense that it's not dead matter, in the sense that we're able to know things, have a moral conscious. But science has explained the parts of our brain that enable us to have that consciousness, and they've traced back the origin of those parts of the brain that enable us to have that consciousness to earlier creatures. But then if the theists say special consciousness, they might just meaning well, the consciousness that God gave us, so which is a fallacious argument. But if they just mean by special, you know, unusual, then it's already been explained. What are some other areas of philosophy of religion, other kinds of questions? You mentioned problem of evil, we know that. Problem of consciousness. What are some other areas that are used to show the fallaciousness of the theistic argument? Well, one argument against theism that is not often used, but I think is, is very telling, is that current science causally explains why the universe exists. And there's no part of the universe that is not caused by an earlier part. And that means there's nothing for a deity or God to cause. Well, in, in, in that argument, the theist would say, with the same data, exactly the same data, precisely the opposite that when you have these series of uh, events, one causing the other, at some point you have to have an uncaused cause, you have to have a first cause, you call it what you will, uh, a self-existent cause, that you can't have this infinite series. That's their argument. Uh, well, they have to justify it, because first of all, ever since... Well, you have to justify your argument. That you can have an infinite series of, of causations, one causing the other. Oh, it could be a finite series. I mean, the universe could start with the Big Bang 15 million years ago, and it'll still be true that every state of the universe is caused by an earlier state. So if you go back like to the first hour of the universe's existence, if you divide it up into smaller and smaller fractions, you can go on to infinity. But each fraction of time during that first hour will be caused by some earlier state of the universe, and there will be no state in the universe corresponding to any fraction that will lack a cause in some earlier state. But you're still left then with what caused that initial condition. Uh, there, there's no initial condition that's uncaused, because what's referred to as initial condition 
is still caused. This suppose, this suppose initial condition, you might say, is uh, uh, 10 uh, 40ths of a second long. Then it will be caused by a state of the universe that's shorter than that. And that goes on to infinity. So there is no initial condition. Well, uh, what are some other kinds of arguments that are used uh, by uh, theists that you would uh, 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 be able to uh, uh, undermine, for example, the, the traditional ones, the, uh, the teleological argument, so-called, the argument from design, that there is some end result design seemingly built into the universe. Well, I think that their argument, if you use it as a stated, it leads to the conclusion that God did not cause our universe. Because the argument is that things in the world are caused by other things in the world and we need some explanation or inference that there is some cause of the whole universe. But a cause, when it's discussed in the premises of the argument, means a cause that is something that brings about the fact, but not logically. It's not like a logical truth, like, like 2 plus 2 equals 4, or like a logical truth, like elm tree is a tree. <laughs> but then when it gets to God, then since God is omnipotent, it logically implies that everything God wills will happen. And right. that is a logical truth, like an elm tree is a tree, and that's not causality. So the design and cosmological arguments for God's existence, they actually prove that God does not exist, that if there is a cause of the universe, it's not God. So how then would you sum up the whole field of philosophy of religion? I would say it's uh, very intelligent uh, theists who are trying to satisfy their intellectual conscience by showing that you, religion is rational to believe. But I think the task of other philosophers is to show that their arguments are fallacious and to point out well, you have these premises, and you refer to that conclusion, but actually, the inference is invalid, or your premise is false, and, or, or else what you're saying is that uh, you're denying a large part of science while claiming you're not. And you have no doubt of which is the winning side. Oh, there's no, no doubt at all, no, of course. <laughs>